Hello everyone, my name is Ki Jin Sung and I'm a postdoc researcher in the Urban Information Lab at the School of Architecture. Um, on behalf of the Good System Smart City team, I'm really happy to share with you the exciting development of the Austin Digital Twin, uh, which is a, some dynamic digital replica of a physical urban environment for the um, for the real-time monitoring, decision support, and the public safety enhancement. So I'll delve into the how Austin Digital Twin will, um, um, how the Austin Digital Twin will, uh, could be the, could more enhance and more, um, <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous, sorry. <laughs> could be um, enhance and um, more um, better for the city and um, we're going to see more look at the more details on the next slide. And after that, uh, Junon will present about the coastal flood risk assessment tool and the next presenter, Loni, who is the external uh, smart city partner, uh, he will um, present more about the um, more potential applications of our project. So here are our team leaderships, and we also have some solid partnership with the um, city of Austin and Austin Fire Department and Texas DOT. And under the big uh, good system umbrella, we mainly focus on how um, the AI could be used for the uh, in uh, under the in in the context of the urban um, context. And <laughs> also, um, we are thinking how to provide some targeted and timely informations. Uh, for the cities through the real-time community awareness platform for monitoring and communicating from, for the urban dynamics to the communities. So from the foundation of the um, team's previous achievement of the fire and smoke um, smart city simulation, we've developed the 3D, um, 3D <laughs> Sorry, 3D Austin Digital Twin, which embodies the convergence of the data sources and the predictive analysis to predict and monitor the dynamics of the Austin area. So this demo shows the, how our original 3D fire and smoke um, spread model have been evolved, and this data has been integrated into the Google 3D tile for uh, more seamless uh, web-based mapping experience. So um, this slide shows the integrated the data form and the uh, processing framework. So we've used both uh, near real-time data and uh, also the statics uh, data sources, including the fire incident data and weather forecast, um, traffic flows and the incidents, and also the census and CDC uh, social vulnerability information, as well as the urban mobility facilities. And aggregating all the data sources, uh, we have created the, uh, some web-based interface uh, within the browser environment. And also um, we've created the prediction models including the um, smoke spread models and the traffic flow simulations, uh, which is the kind of a big um, stepping stones towards the 3D digital twin model development. And we also expect our 3D digital twin could be um, kind of a platform for the data-driven uh, decision-making for the stakeholders. So Austin Digital Twin has the three main layers. Uh, first layer is the mobility and the transportation infrastructure layer. And the second one is the human behavior monitoring. And also the third layer is the resilience planning. 
uh, in the mobility layer um, led by the Dr. Yiming Su, uh, we collected the uh, kind of uh, some traffic camera information in real time and integrated into the, uh, the web-based map. And also um, the real time traffic constant, um, condition data collected by the um, Google Maps um, JavaScript API and also the traffic um, incident report collected from the city of Austin in real time that were also collected and processed, visualized in the web-based platform. And in the second layer, the human behavior monitoring, um, we focused on in in identifying the crime and the noise patterns and also synthesized the some kinds of uh, um, different various data sets um, to analyze and predict some, um, some different impact on the urban elements, such as the, the effect of the, the crime rates and the noise levels on the real estate prices. And the third layer is the resilience planning. So here um, we created uh, some water management map that can provide some um, current and past um, water management project, um, such as the, the bacteria monitoring or some um, the water quality assessment, and also. In other layer, we created a watershed quality map that can uh, monitor the watershed health, including the water chemicals, sediment levels, or some um, vegetation health, or some uh, habitat quality. So I think um, our digital twin could help uh, more the cities and benefit literally uh, in many ways. And also the, our digital twin will be the Austin's, the very first 3D um, digital twin models that mirrors the city's physical system in real time. Um, we believe there are lots of possibilities that can uh, city can be benefit from our digital twin development. Um, the digital twin uh, can synthesize the data and simulate and uh, also monitor the real-time data and create the web-based uh, information, sharing it into the composite and comprehensive tools that can enhance the um, emergency res response and improve the, some uh, public safety and also the foster the collective urban development. So with these tools, um, I believe and we expect we could more preactively shape of safer communities. Yeah, thank you for listening and I'll pass the mic to Julan. All right, so following the Austin Digital Twin tool, I would like to share about the AI-powered daytime, nighttime cause of flood risk assessment tool, which, was, which is being developed as part of the Good System for Smart Cities project. So this tool is designed to address the storm surges, which are destructive and coastal natural hazards that can affect coastal cities around the world. And this photo shows the 2005 Hurricane Katrina, which generated a storm surge exceeding 7.5 meters of sea level. And this event has been recorded as the coastalist natural hazards in US history. And storm surges can make more damage in the coming years because of the growing coastal populations. So about two thirds of the world population already live near the coast and approximately 75% of the world population is expected to live near the coast in the next three decades, which means that the storm surge will have more significant impact to coastal cities. Then what is needed to better understand and respond to this increased risk from coastal flooding? 
Several studies have emphasized the need for a robust cost of risk assessment that incorporates both hazards and vulnerability at the same time. However, many cost of risk assessment framework often overlook the temporal aspects of the cost of risk, leading to underestimated and misrepresented the cost of risk. And this is a huge problem because the timing of the cost of flooding can significantly impact the coastal city's vulnerability and resilience. Um, during, the day, during the day, the consequences may differ from the factors such as the population density, infrastructure uses, or transportation network. So through these projects, we are developing an AI-powered, the daytime, nighttime coastal flood risk assessment tool that incorporates the temporal dimension of the coastal risk. And this tool comprises three main factors, hazard, vulnerability, and risk. So in terms of hazards, we recently developed a machine learning model that is specifically designed to rapidly predict the storm surge from the um, hurricane track time series information for the coastal Texas area. And users have the options to choose either the deterministic flood map that is generated by the AI model or the probabilistic hazard, the flood hazard map, like a 500 year flood on the right side for their risk assessments. And in terms of vulnerability, traditionally the social vulnerability index has been widely used that incorporates several socioeconomic factors such as poverty level, education, and also the um, employment um, ratio within the communities. And through these projects, we develop a new methodology that can um, decompose the social vulnerability index into the daytime components and the nighttime components based on the population distribution data like the right two maps. And the final outcomes or the outputs of this tool is the risk map. So the left figure shows the total cost of risk, which is the conventional approach that is widely used for the last decades. And the right two maps, which is the daytime and nighttime cost of risk, where the red color represents the high risk and the yellow represents the relatively low risk areas. And these maps are highlighting the difference of the risk distribution between the daytime and nighttime, which was not captured with the traditional risk maps. And we believe that this new tool has the potential to create a targeted evacuation plan and enhance infrastructures and also strengthen the community resilience and ultimately reduce the socioeconomic impacts linked with the cause of flooding. And with that, I will hand the microphone to the next speaker, Lonely. Uh, thank you. Um, well, so I've been asked as a, a community representative to really kind of bring these things together um, and how we could apply both um, AI generated, um, you know, predictive skills with the digital twin approach. Uh, so first for context, I'm the executive director for movability, uh, which is the transportation management association in the region. Uh, we mostly focus on trying to address congestion in the region and we do work with the major um, government agencies in the region, including um, TxDOT and the city of Austin, the county, um, addressing issues for congestion, um, but also other urban planning issues. And so when looking at the tool, um, I can easily see three buckets in which um, this could be applied. Uh, and we've talked about them so far, uh, an urban planning context, a disaster readiness um, context, and then of course, um, my favorite area, congestion mitigation. And so when looking at urban planning, um, certainly there are some things that can easily be predicted by AI and then how you would respond to those. Um, so mapping heat island effect, um, you can see where there are hot spots in the grid and then come up with mitigation strategies. That could be um, you know, street trees, which is something that is difficult to actually do, especially when you consider what the um, utilities underneath those streets are and how much um, room you have for things like um, the roots underneath a, a street. Um, when you're designing that infrastructure. Um, you could also do a parkland census and see which parts of the city are <clears throat> lacking green space um, to address that issue. 
um, you would be able to look at flood mapping. Now, not just um, your urban creeks or what would happen if there was a certain rainfall event, um, but also the impact of building new infrastructure. Every time you put more impervious cover, it does impact where water falls depending on um, future uh, impacts. So as a result, you could predict how that would impact uh, the rest of the community around it. Um, in addition, air quality could be predicted as well, not for just things like we're used to, Sahara dust storms, um, allergens coming through, um, smoke or fire incidents, um, but also for car idling. Um, we know that um, uh, school pick up and drop off causes car idling and we could predict when there would be spikes. In addition, um, for disaster readiness, we talked about um, um, public service demand. Um, public service demand comes when you build new homes and infrastructure. So you might know, oh, well, we can see what the response time would be for a certain fire station. We could see um, how many people would need to go to a school. We would see uh, if there was an extra demand on a, a, a police precinct. Um, but that would also allow you to predict what the pathways would be for those first responders and also what the pathways would be if there was an incident. So if there is a fire and it's blocking that pathway, what would be the alternative pathway? Um, naturally, you can also predict for other things that we would expect here like fire or flooding, um, but also hostage situations, bomb threats, and you'd be able to run those scenarios in advance rather than having to run them in real time. You could predict them um, through this application. And of course, evacuation planning, especially in coastal environments. For congestion mitigation, we regularly do traffic modeling, but you'd also be able to look at different solutions. Um, so you could look at a traffic circle and how that might impact versus a light. Um, you could look at HOV planning. So if you had a bi-directional HOV lane, you could determine when it would make sense to go northbound versus southbound, um, how to um, uh, host a manage lane. Maybe you have two lanes there, and at certain times of the day, they're both heading north, or at some times of the day, one is heading north or south, and predict how it would handle the, manage, uh, 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 the, the traffic flow. Um, you can also do real-time wayfinding. Right now, um, things like uh, you know Google Maps uh, are sharing information with the city based on the movement of your car. If you have the information beforehand, we could be communicating to them to tell your car to avoid hot spots rather than we learning that your car is already avoiding a hot spot and then telling everybody else to avoid the hot spot. So you're getting ahead of, of the problem by rebalancing congestion. So when the opportunities are pretty obvious, it's being more responsive, getting ahead of things like climate change and alerting the public in real time and being more responsive um, with traffic congestion or trying to avoid it. It's the challenges that I think are, are more difficult. So this is a massive data collection problem. And I can say that even in doing air quality monitors, if you go to a place like a public school, finding a place to plug in an air quality monitor with electricity that also has Wi-Fi is very difficult to do. Um, being able to get monitors all around the city, a dynamic city that is changing at all times is very difficult to do. You'll have privacy concerns, as was brought up earlier, um, and then you have to think about what optimal is. Um, do we want to protect um, the most number of people? Do we want the cheapest solution? Um, do we want to run people through um, a neighborhood? Um, do we want to reduce traffic? Because if we reduce traffic and the traffic flow is more, we might induce traffic and send more people in that direction. And then we have the induced demand trap. And then, of course, the elephant in the room is cost um, for a solution like this. So lots of practical um, applications and opportunities, but certainly some challenges for this as well. Um, but I do applaud uh, the opportunity, and I hope to um, work on this in the future. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, this question is for Lonnie. Um, I'm curious, with the April uh, eclipse coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, and hundreds of thousands of people coming to Central Texas to watch the eclipse, yeah. uh, has any of this uh, helped uh, 
inform the planning around that particular event? Um, well, I will tell you, uh, I am not planning to get stuck on 290 or 71 uh, going out to the hill country to get an extra 15 or 20 seconds of the eclipse. Uh, I, I will tell you that my plan has always been to use a bus and a train to go and see it. Uh, I know that um, at the Leander station there's going to be an eclipse nick. I would tell you to do something like that, take the train up there, um, go to Auditorium Shores or Zilker Park. These are places that you can easily get to without using a car. If you use a car, you're going to get stuck in traffic on that day. I can guarantee it. So highly recommend avoiding that. But um, you don't need an AI model to predict that. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we know people are coming here. There are six places on Yeah, take a bike, take a train, take a bus. Share, share the ride. If you have to drive, carpool. This is for anyone on the panel, but it came up on one of your slides, Lonnie, and it, there was a reference to induced demand trap. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that and what that means for the, the entire sort of smart city's edifice of infrastructure. Uh, well, sure. Uh, well, so in an effort to make things run more smoothly, um, we try to um, reduce traffic. And when you reduce traffic on a roadway, um, everybody knows that the road is running more smoothly. Um, so, for example, on Mopac, we added a toll lane. And so when that happened, um, traffic went down temporarily. And then the word got out, so everybody started heading to Mopac. And then in a very short amount of time, traffic went back to the same level of delay on that road. And so you can't really build your way out. And the way to think about it best is that traffic isn't a liquid, it behaves more like a gas, and it will fill whatever container you give it. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, one thing I noticed that's kind of uh, uh, lacking in your model is the communication capability. Okay. For, for example, okay, if everybody has a uh, smartphone that can communicate with every other smartphone, no, I mean, I can broadcast a message, for example, right? Okay. So, so the, the communication capability is going to affect how well you can use all your other tools to help solve problems. So how much is uh, communication going to be taken into account? Um, I, I think the work that they've done it can easily make that communications leap. Um, and, you know, currently, um, we're working with a consortium of different government agencies uh, the, through the Construction Partnership Program. And um, that's TxDOT, Cap Metro, the City of Austin, the Austin Transit Partnership, because they're building I-35 and the light rail and the convention center and 183 all at the same time. Oh, and the airport. And um, all of their teams are building um, construction projects and they're gonna be feeding that data to Google Maps. And, um, and in order for them to know when those roads are under construction and there's constrained right of way. So, so long as their data model has data, it can be pushed out into the cloud. Um, so, uh, so I wouldn't be worried about that. If their data set exists, it can, it can be communicated to all of us in real time. And, and I think that was one of the benefits is that they'd be getting ahead of it. The current model is once you're in a traffic jam, your phone is communicating to the cloud to the rest of us. This would get ahead of that. Thank you very much.